Let me uh, share with you how we are going to look at four topics. First, there are many challenges for Italy. Secondly, you have to build a good marketing and sales organization. Third, we have to move from only doing traditional marketing, 30-second TV commercials, mass marketing, we have to move from that to using the digital media. We are in a digital age, and I do not want to eliminate 30-second commercials. They're very useful for building a brand, but we must also do social marketing, social media marketing. And fourth, I want to talk about marketing 3.0 and social responsibility. Now, let's start with this idea of the challenges. And I'm using a picture of a piece of glass. I happen to be a major collector of glass, big kinds of glass. And the reason I was attracted to this is the artist managed to show the earth and inside the earth is a tree, and yet the planet is fragile. It's delicate. We have to treat it right so that trees continue to grow, and so on. The challenges are many. You know them. What are you going to do about globalization? Is Italy sufficiently globalized? Are you a country that just wants to do business with your own businesses in Italy. Uh, how many of you have gone to China? How, how much business are you doing with China, exporting and even opening maybe a small factory in China or India? The idea is always go to the countries that are growing. Don't go to countries that are not growing. Don't go to countries that don't have money. Always go to where the growth is. And don't go to many of them. Focus. Make Italy a well-known name and its products well-known in maybe three countries that are going to be your future uh, uh, and so on. Uh, Chindia, by the way, is just a, a made-up word for the two nations of China and India. Um, there's a lot of regional work because you're part of the European Union, so you have to Sometimes you are, you're angry at the European Union. It, it, it has its rules. Uh, but just in the same way, my, my, my state of Illinois, where the city of Chicago is, doesn't like the rules maybe from the federal government. So there's always a conflict between the local, the regional, and the national. And you have to live with that. The internet and social media is the nature of the the, the civilization we're in now. It's a new civilization. It's a civilization that allows people to communicate with so many other people, connectedness. It turns out that I will meet a person who nobody knows much about, and he will tell me he has a thousand followers and maybe 700 fans. The media, the digital media, allows you to connect with everyone else in the world. In fact, the smart marketers try to identify who has the biggest network. If I want to reach a lot of people with my product, and I get the person who has a big network to like my product, it goes around the world. If I could get uh, Lady Gaga, to say something about my book, the world will hear about it, right? 40 million people. So that's the nature of the new society. But it's one of hyper-competition. You've got to watch your competitors. And it is uh, a, pr a case where if you have a successful new product, it's likely to be copied very fast. It's likely that since it's successful, I'll copy it. For example, yesterday and today, I rode in this new car called the Tesla. That is a fantastic car. It can drive itself. The, the driver can go to sleep. Someone's going to try to compete with that. 
Someone's going to say it's, it could be Toyota, it could be N Nissan, it could be Fiat. They're going to... So how long does a new product last and remain popular? Much shorter now. Things are copied very fast. Many products are seen to be similar. Uh, some markets, it doesn't matter where you buy your salt. It does, the brand doesn't matter for, let's say, some, uh, some applesauce, if there's three brands, or the brand of soap. So how do I make a choice? And my answer is, if I gave you a, an index, you could look up on the internet, and it said, the good company index. And by good company, I mean a company that pays good wages to its people, and a company that practices sustainability. And you don't know if you should buy the soap from company A or B. Should you buy it from Procter & Gamble or from Unilever? Look up my good company index when it's available. It may say that company A is much better as a citizen than company B. That means that more people buying the soap will buy it from the good company, and the companies not so good have to change. They also have to become good. So I'm trying to popularize the idea that the market itself will take care of bad companies by creating information about what the good companies are, then you got to be a good company too. Okay. The next point is the retail world is changing. The big problem is, should I even have a store or should I just sell online? Uh, look what happened to bookstores. Many of them have closed. People can get from Amazon any book right now in one minute by downloading a book you want. So many businesses have been destroyed by the digital world. And we have to look at what's the future of shopping centers. Some of them are in trouble now. What, what about Walmart? Will Walmart take over the world? So we have some retail experts, and they are available to help retailers adjust themselves to the new threats and so on. Media. So much more media than we've ever had before. You've got to be using Facebook. You've got to be using Google. You've got to be using YouTube, LinkedIn, and so on. Uh, and then the environment. Is my company hurting the environment or helping the environment? And then recognize the main point is consumers are smarter. They can learn whatever they want to learn about you. They can look up your website. They can see other opinions. There are many polls that rank companies. Let's say if I'm going to buy an automobile, I'm going to look up what other people have said about that automobile on the internet. And uh, JP, the Polk, uh, there's, there's a whole rating system. And I could even learn what I ought to pay for that car. So the result is a certain kind of problem, and the problem is called slow economic growth. So let me tell you something about that. When times were good, when there were factories full of people making things, the people in the factories usually had a good income, an income that could support them, them and their wife and their children, and have a good life and afford a vacation and so on. What's happening now is factories are not found in most places anymore. They're found mostly in China. China is, have became the factory of the world, just like India became the office of the world, because India was supplying us with many uh, telephone and digital services for accountants and so on. And furthermore, factories are changing from having a thousand people to having one person running a factory and 
a dog to wake up the person in case he doesn't see the dials. In other words, automation of the factory is proceeding very fast, raising a question, will there be enough jobs in Italy for the number of people in Italy? Will there be enough jobs in the United States for the number of, of workers? It's, no one has the answer. You're going to have to be either a pessimist or optimist about the future of work. Because if there's going to be a job shortage as the world problem, we're going to have to learn to share the jobs. France, as a country, has already worked on that by saying, well, the job shouldn't be 40 hours a week, it should be 35 hours a week. Or maybe your work should be three days a week. But how do we pay for less work? So I don't have answers, but it's, it's a problem. Now, so the world is divided into pessimists and optimists. A pessimist who's asked about the future growth of the, of the GDP, the gross domestic product, they are saying that we're, we will not go back to 4% growth in Europe that we used to have, or China's 10% growth, which they had for some years, that, in fact, it's going to be slow growth. Uh, one of the top economists named Larry Summers Larry was the head of Harvard University. He was the uh, president of Harvard. In a recent statement, he said that the growth will be 1 or 2 percent for the next 50 years. That's very depressing. That's very depressing. And another economist at my university, Northwestern University, actually looked at all the numbers and said pretty much the same thing for the United States. It won't go back to 4 or 5% growth. It will be about a half of 1%. On the other hand, pick up a book called Abundance. Abundance. And the book is written by a very brilliant person named Peter Diamandis. Peter Diamandis is the one who created the famous X Prize. If you know about the X Prize, it is given to anyone who solves a major problem in the world. For example, if you can make an automobile that could go 100 miles on one gallon of gas, you will win $10 million. If you could clean up an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, Within hours of it happening, as opposed to weeks and weeks of oil spreading through the Gulf, you will win $10 million. He's the man who created that idea, and he also created a new university called Singularity University in San Francisco. The purpose of Singularity University is so different than any other university. You go there for training in nanotechnology, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, networks and sensors. The courses are highly technical to make you prepared to innovate. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you go to Singularity University and you'll meet so many other people who also want to innovate better solutions. In his book called Abundance, which he just published, he predicts a world where we will end poverty in 20 years. There will be no poverty. Food will be abundant because of the ability to grow the yields. Instead of getting 10 bananas from a tree, you'll get 50 bananas from a tree. The water will be desalinized, desalinized so that water is abundant everywhere. So his picture is one of great optimism for the future. But it's nothing we can settle right now. So let me continue. Let me look at the following questions. Here's the first one. And if you have a pencil and you come from a company, use this as a uh, uh, putting down a number after each of these nine things. There are nine items, and give yourself 
up to five points per item. So if you have a, a five, a five, a five, nine times, you will get a score of 45. <clears throat> so for your company, my first question is, is your company good at finding new opportunities? <clears throat> now, the fact is, uh, even two people in your company may disagree. If I were to go into your company, I would look at what opportunities did, did you discover in the last five years? What new things did you do? <clears throat> Second question, are you using marketing research and marketing analytics? And, and do you have big data? Because we're at a time now where the internet permits us to know much about every person in the world. That's called big data. But just having big data is not enough because you've got to dig through it. You've got to do market analytics so you can learn and get insight from the big data. So how many points do you want to give to your company for number two? The third, have you innovated anything? Are you pretty good? pretty successful at innovating. What about communication? Do you think your company has a good image, that it's clear and powerful, the brand is well understood, or not? Give yourself anywhere from one point, if there's very poor communication, all the way to five points. The next thing, do you run your sales force efficiently? Do you have a sales force? Do you manage the cost of the sales force very carefully. For example, my ideal company in Salesforce management is called Salesforce.com. Salesforce.com is such a powerful company and it creates the kind of data it would help you know how to manage your sales force by what each salesperson is doing during the day and so on. Next, are you running good distribution channels? Have you created any new distribution channels? Remember, in the old days, all you did at a gas station was to get some fuel. Today, the gas station is a money-making store, and, and the gas doesn't make that much money, it's the store. So how do you find new channels of distribution? Would you say you have a well-thought-out marketing strategy? Would you give your strategy a five, or a four, or a three, or a two, or a one? Uh, are you well organized for marketing? Do you have a good CMO, chief marketing officer? Do you have a good, uh, th does he or she have good respect from the other officers, from the chief financial officer and the chief um, manufacturing officer? And then finally, does your company practice some corporate social responsibility and so on? Now, I'm not gonna ask you to turn this in if we had that, uh, sometimes you're in an audience which has a number uh, thing. Everyone has a number, and then we could show how many of you had 45 points, how many had 44. So we're not going to do that. But I would worry if, I'm your, if I am you and your score is like 20 out of 45, that means you better go back to read the books on marketing and so on. Okay. But let's take this and move on. Someone might say, we're an old industry. We are the coffee. We, we make coffee. There's no opportunity for us in the coffee industry. Well, Starbucks? Starbucks didn't believe there's no opportunity. It's an old product, but they, they created it as your home. It's your third home. I mean, when you... Um, your first home is your family, the second is the office, the third is Starbucks. Pleasant. Take your computer there, sit there all day. Meet your friends at Starbucks. Now, what, what about Zara? You all know, you, you are to be complimented on a, co a company as, as strong and interesting as Zara, changing its merchandise every two weeks, which says to uh, a young lady, if she doesn't buy what she sees now that she likes, it won't be there two weeks later. And what about Zappos? Zappos is a firm run by um, a man called Tony Hasea. 
And his job is to produce happiness, not sell shoes. If he's selling shoes, it's to make you happier. But he wants his employees to be happier. He wants his suppliers to be happier. He, he uses the word happify. He's in the business of happifying, making people happy. And by the way, if you buy a pair of shoes from Tony, and shoes are an old business, what's new is he will give a free pair of shoes to a poor person because you bought shoes from him. This is a new idea, by the way. It's also being practiced by an, a company that makes eyeglasses. When you buy a pair of eyeglasses from them, some poor person who could not afford having a pair of glasses will get one. Well, I, I'm going to buy from that company. I'm going to buy from Zappos. So it's, it's a new idea for you to think about. Now, what about new industries? We just proved that old industries could be redone and, and vitalized. Uh, yes, the software or many young people don't want to work for a big company. They want to create a app or software or a game. And uh, ro robotics is, is coming more and more. I am waiting for someone to invent a robot butler. So I say to the butler at home, get me some coffee. He walks and gets coffee for me. I say, clean the living room. He pushes the, the broom or the, the, the vacuum. So Japan is working on that, by the way. Japan has a butler now. It can't do everything, but... And there's a movie that just came out about a woman that was created. It's, the movie's called Ex Machina. Machina. The woman actress is not a real woman, but looks like a real woman. She is basically a robot with all the electronics. So what, engine, what world of innovation do you want to go into? What about bioengineering? What about 3D printing? What people are saying now is every home that has a Hewlett Packard printer will also have a 3D printer. And it will be used to make whatever you want to make. It could be a beautiful vessel. It could be a very complicated thing. They say that the auto industry is making its parts using 3D printing. They say that if you're lost on an island, there's two things you want. One is to have your iPhone, if you're lost on an island. The other is to have a 3D printer because the 3D printer will allow you to make a boat or to print, so to speak, something that's missing. So it's a world of new opportunities. Are there new opportunities in other countries? Yes. Asia comes to mind first. I must be selling things in Asia. Eventually, it will be Africa. Eventually, the next big place is when some countries in Africa where the wages are lower, you know, even China will lose factories to places in Africa. So Italy has a, a history in Africa. Italy, of course, went into uh, Abyssinia. Uh, uh, you, you had a colony in, in, in Africa, uh, and so on and so forth. So watch that. Are there new opportunities for companies that could lower the price of something? Yes. Let's look at what Tata did, Mr. Tata. He said, it's a very interesting story in India, he would notice motorcycles with a father driving it, a mother behind him, and children, five or six family people on one motorcycle, and accidents happening, killing a whole family. And he said, you know, it shouldn't be a motorcycle, it should be a cheap car. Let's make a car for $2,500. And for eight years, they worked on the nano car. You could buy one. And the nano car, I think it's $2,500. 
it didn't succeed as well as he expected because it's really a covered motorcycle. The problem is people who had $2,500 in India wanted to move up a little more and get a little better car. So the Nano got them excited about owning a car, but there was the next level, and they ended up buying the next level. But look, we used to say at MIT, eventually a computer will only cost $100. No one believed it. And now you can get a com and, and, back, and basically, you got the computer for less than $100. It's, it's right in my pocket. So uh, sneakers for $1. $1, uh, uh, something to wear for your feet. So ask yourself, whatever business you're in, is there a market in driving the price even lower, making it more affordable for more people? And uh, India is the country to watch. India is the one that is smart about how to bring down the cost of normal products. And then there's the luxury market, which is your market. Are there other things you can do at the upper end of the market? And you're, you have the advantage of such a following in greatly designed products made of great leather and fabrics and you used to have the company Olivetti. Olivetti was a wonderful company at the time. It was, a, it was one to be proud of because they paid the workers well. They, paid, they gave them housing. I'm sorry, it didn't move fast enough into computers. It went into computers, but it was not successful in moving from typewriters to computers. But the, the point I want to make is some of you are making products that should be uh, going after the market that is the rich market. The rich people have so much money. In fact, uh, there are so many new billionaires. You know where they are? China has more billionaires now. India has, Russia has billionaires. They're, they're all going to go Italian. I'm sure they're going to go Italian. That is, you'll sell a lot of products to them and maybe find out what else you could make for them and bring them over here as tourists. And then are there opportunities in specific sectors? So have you done anything to improve the health sector, the education sector? Look, uh, look at the gift you gave us in education. Isn't it the Montessori method? It's Montessori from Italy? My daughters all grew up with Montessori, and it's a fabulous way to get an education as a child. So what else can you do for us in, in improving education, getting more people? And, and energy, we're all hoping to find new ways to get good energy, solar and wind and so on. We were told recently, my wife and I, that we, we, should, so, we should solarize our home and we'll end up at much lower cost than buying electricity from the public uh, company. And we could even sell extra energy from having a solar roof and, uh, and a battery coming from this uh, company that uh, we, uh, there's this famous man, Elon Musk, who created the Tesla car. He is building the world's biggest factory for making batteries not only for his car, but for your home. You're going to have a battery at home to supply energy at much less money to you than you are spending now. Okay. Now, if someone says, we don't have any more new innovations, no, what else could we do? We're at the end of innovations. Well, um, the digital wallet is another way to call the iPhone or a smartphone. By the way, now we have digital watches. I don't know if it's going to be successful because all of us have watches anyways, but Apple is trying to... Apple is busy making a digital car. The next big car may come from Apple. I even suspect Amazon. Amazon may go into the car business. 
Zip cars. Zip cars is the idea of, I don't have to own a car. When I need one, I just go and pay for it by the hour. It, mean, it would mean that in Milan, there are several places where several cars are sitting, and you, you phone to reserve the car and, 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 and use it. In New York City, no one wants to own a car. I don't think in Milano, maybe a lot of people may not want to own a car. The big thing happening there are the cars being supplied by private people with their own car. This whole new development that the taxi companies are upset with. Who would think that some people who own their own car will drive you somewhere and you pay them, much less than for a taxi, and some people who have a, an extra room in their home will rent their room in the home. This is called the shared economy. It's a new development that if you have any asset, you could price it. For example, let's say you live in a community and you have a very good lawnmower to cut the grass. Why should every neighbor have a, a lawnmower? One has it and the others rent it from the neighbor. So this is a whole new idea. There's a woman, I'm trying to remember her name. She's on, tele, on YouTube. She is the person who spreads the gospel of the shared economy. Yes, Uber and Airbnb. Uh, this whole idea of the single serve coffee maker, who would ever think coffee would be an have new blood in it, uh, a, a new life. But when I was in Paris, I remember how many people were going to the Nestle, Nestle shop. It was like it was a bookstore, it was so popular. They were going to buy some kind of something that serves one cup of coffee at a time. You put in the little pellet and you, you choose your types of coffee. So that's, now Kidzania, you've not heard of. You should hear about it. You should look it up. It was created by my former student um, who was always trying to say, what could we do for kids? Well, there's Disneyland, right? Oh, all the kids want to go to Disneyland. But he had this idea. Disneyland is only fun. Why don't we take our young people seriously and give them an experience that their father is having who's working in an industry? So Kidzania is so exciting, it, when it's, it's, it's now, there's 12 Kidzanias in the world. Two are in Japan, one is in Thailand, one is in Mexico, one is coming to Chicago. He buys up some land. He puts buildings on the land. There's a, a ticket, ticketing system. And each child is brought by the parent, and the child says what he wants to be. One of them says, I want to be a pilot. So he goes to the section where there's actually a plane, part of a plane, and there's the dials, and he's getting an experience of what a pilot experiences. Another one says, I'd like to be the mayor of a city. Because Kizania is a city. Another one says, I'd like to run a supermarket. So there is a supermarket with things to sell in it, and shelves. So for the first time, it's fun and it's educational. The kids learn that what adults are doing. They are doctors. One kid says, I want to be a brain surgeon. So he goes into the, the there's a room with a, a, a patient who's about to be operated on. It's a dummy, of course. So Kidzania should come to Italy. I think you would, you would just love to invite them to open up a Kidzania here. IBM's Watson. Do you remember hearing that uh, there was a quiz show and they had the best quiz uh, people, the ones who won many times, against the IBM machine. So a question would be asked, who, uh, who wrote uh, the, the book Gone with the Wind? And of course, uh, the the, the, these very professional, smart people knew too, but it was answered faster by IBM. IBM's data covered everything that could be asked. And not only that, the machine 
predicts the probability that the answer is correct. And IBM beat the world's best informed people. And by the way, that happened earlier. Um, IBM beat Gary Kasparov, the world's chess master. I had the chance of riding the car with Gary Kasparov because we were in a program together. So we're going back to the hotel. And I said to Gary, do you have time to play a game of chess? I knew I'd be defeated. He says, oh, no time, sorry. So I never played a game with him. I would have lost in the first five moves, probably. But uh, IBM beat him. But by IBM is not the winner now. A German software program beat IBM's. So the winners of chess is no longer people. It's the software. Who has the better software? So here's what IBM is working on. It's a, it's a fantastic idea. Someone has a terrible problem, maybe can, some kind of cancer. Um, so that person will go to this doctor, get the opinion, maybe check with a second opinion doctor, or could go to IBM, which is preparing the following. For that cancer, IBM has collected all the information in the world of all the people who had that cancer, and all the treatments that were used, let's say there were three treatments, and the probability of success of each of those treatments, so a doctor no longer has to know what is the best treatment. IBM has put together the information that the doctor goes to get about what treatment is the best for that patient. Fantastic. Fantastic. So to say that there aren't new things in the world uh, would be a mistake. Um, there, isn't, there is even a case where someone wrote a book called Free and, and illustrated how you could use the idea that my product is free to get new customers and then turn it into a premium level where you now give even more after they became dependent on that free service. Um, I think you'll see this when you're using things in the internet that you could always buy, even though it's free, you could get it at a higher level. Well, let, let's move on. So that makes a point, doesn't it? That uh, there's a lot of innovation. But innovations mean disruption. So a word that has become famous now is disruptive technology, disruptive innovation. And I'm not going to talk about m m many examples, but let's just take the, one of the best known one. And that is, what has happened to Kodak? What has happened to Kodak? Kodak is not to be found because they were making film and along comes the, uh, the iPhone and other things and digital photography and nobody needs to buy film anymore. So that's an excellent example of why you must be very, have a lot of foresight what is happening in the world and how will it make us vulnerable. And those are other examples there that we won't go into. So you need three skills. One skill is vulnerability analysis. Every company has to ask, where are we vulnerable? What is coming along in technology that might change our business? What is coming along in competitors who are getting, doing something different and new? Um, at least the head of the company should periodically ask, every six months, let's look at our vulnerabilities again. Let's not just think everything is fine. But also do opportunity analysis. What, is, what new opportunities do we have? You, you would make that the responsibility of the marketing person. I want the marketing CMO is the closest to the market, much closer than manufacturing people and finance people. The marketing person should have a list of new directions in which a company can move. And then you should be skilled at scenario planning. 
imagining the next three or five years, what new things are happening, and what scenario would you want to bet on? You don't just prepare one scenario, because you have to put some uncertainty into the picture and to make some guess as how likely is something to happen. And through scenario analysis, which is used by Shell Oil Company and others, you have a picture of where the world's going and where you should move. So I want to move to this next point about building your marketing organization. And I'm showing you a picture that is in a book that just won the prize as the best marketing book this year by two Australians, fathers and son, father and son, Lyndon and Chris Brown. Their book is called The Customer Culture Imperative. And they have a chart that captures what they think you need to know as a marketer. And, I'm, and you notice that they have different color schemes. And notice that not all colors reach the, the perimeter. It doesn't fill the whole perimeter, which means they're, they're not equally strong in everything. But let me read what you cannot read, probably. It all starts with something that's called customer insight. It's the one on, on the far, far right, to my right over here. It's that green one that says 60%. What, for that, this is for a company that they studied. And they have a way to measure the amount of customer insight. Is this a company with, a, with great customer insight, average or poor? They gave it 60%. But they didn't stop with customer insight. The next thing, 81%, is customer foresight. Customer insight is to know your customers today. Customer foresight is to know where the customers are moving tomorrow and what they will want in the way of prices and features. The next one is called um, company uh, competitor insight. Yes, you, you certainly should have a good understanding of how your co competitors are behaving, but also do competitor foresight in the next three years, who the, will the competitors be? Who will be stronger ones? And so on. Then they move to the next thing that is in that uh, sort of uh, uh, pink color, peripheral vision. By the way, there's a chapter on each of these. How do you get customer insight? How do you get customer foresight? Competitor insight, uh, competitor foresight. How do you get peripheral vision? Peripheral vision is I could look straight at you, but maybe in the corner of my eyes I see a much broader picture. They talk a lot about having an enlarged vision of the forces. By the way, when I drove the te in the Tesla car, it reminded me of peripheral vision. That car not only knows about the car in front of it, it knows the car on the other road, on the, on the, if it's a three-lane road, it knows the whole field of where different cars are because it it has the capacity to slow down automatically when it's coming, when an, another car comes in front of it. It's an intelligent car that you put on cruise control. Cruise control. Normally with cruise control, when a car gets in your way, you, 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 you get off of cruise control. You never have to get off of cruise control because it has peripheral vision about what is surrounding the car in the way of other cars which is the way you should think about your business. You need peripheral vision. Then collaboration, and finally strategic alignment, where your strategy is taking advantage of the insight and the foresight with the customers and the competitors. So it's just a book that I've been quite impressed with, uh, bringing up to date some notions about customer orientation. Is there a difference between selling and marketing? Yes. Selling is so old, we, we sold in the Bible times. Marketing is only 110 years old. I use this cartoon. Who was the first salesperson? 
Well, go ahead. Who do you think was the first person who, who, who did sales? Not Eve. Not Eve. Eve convinced Adam, but it was the snake. The snake convinced Eve to give Adam the apple. So we know a lot about selling, but marketing is only 110 years old. The textbooks on marketing. You might even say, why did we need marketing if you, if you know how to sell? Well, you have to organize your, your sales force to know where the markets are. Your markets, the best ones for you. So, marketing started because the sales per, uh, department needed three things. Salesmen cannot be effective unless they have some information on customers and consumers. So someone has to find the information of where are the companies that are buying things. Uh, and, and finding leads. Oh, there is a certain company that might buy our machine. And then, Preparing brochures, because if you're going to sell a machine, you need some, even if you don't buy advertising, you need a little uh, colorful pamphlet that would describe your business. So no, what happened is, originally there was no marketing, but there were sales forces needing some help, so they would add three or four people who were not selling, but helping the sales force, including an advertising agency. So eventually, they created a marketing department of these people separate from the sales force. And this is a diagram that I used in an article called Ending the War Between Sales and Marketing. This is a map of just sales. It captures everything you need to know about sales. In other words, good selling means you start with prospecting. You qualify whether that prospect has got money to buy your product and has interest. Uh, you define the actual needs of that person. You uh, develop a solution or a proposal. You probably have to adjust the proposal because he's not quite happy with the price. And then uh, finally a contract and then you implement the contract. And basically what you're trying to do is to develop a purchase intention. He really is intending to pay attention. He buys, he buys again and again, he gets to be loyal, and the best thing that could happen is he likes you so much he tells everyone else. Don't forget that last step. The last step is called consumer advocacy. Um, our customer, you, if, you're, if you don't have fans, if you just have people who bought your product, but they never talk about you and tell others, it's not good. So, but where's marketing? There's no marketing shown here. That's sales. So marketing is there, but it's, it starts earlier. So in the yellow is the marketing. And what we mean by uh, marketing is, first, it creates customer awareness. We exist as a company. It tells the right people. It creates brand awareness. It creates brand consideration. So after a lot of people know about the brand, we guide their thinking to us as the best brand. And then we really succeed if we build what is called brand preference. If I'm going to drink something, it will be Coca-Cola. If I'm going to have a hamburger, it will be McDonald's. That, that is brand preference, which is the, the, the goal. Um, now, that's marketing. So marketing lays the plans for building up a, a, an appreciation of the market. Now, the question is, um, sales have to then pick up all those leads and, and move. And um, sometimes there's a problem of friction between the yellow and the orange, friction. One of the frictions is the salesmen say, the advertising money isn't doing much work. My customers don't even know. They, they never saw your ad, or it's a bad ad. So why are we wasting money on advertising? Why not hire more salespeople? That's logical. If advertising doesn't seem to be working, spend it on, on, uh, on salespeople. Or they say, I don't like the quota. I can't sell 100 units a month. You're, that's ridiculous. The price is too high. As a matter of fact, lower the price, and I, as the salesman, could sell more. 
So there's a lot of friction, and I, I wrote up this problem in an article called Ending the War Between Marketing and Sales. And that's in the Harvard Business Review. And I won't go over these, but these were six ways proposed to bring about more collaboration and harmony between sales and marketing. So let me say that marketing's focus has been changing. Originally, when we got into marketing, we were really just an automobile company trying to sell cars or, or, or selling watches. We, it was the product. Then in the 70s to the 90s, we got into what's called a customer orientation. Everything should start with knowing and choosing your customers. Choose the customers you want and know a lot about them. Then in the next decade, branding as an idea became popular. By the way, some people even think branding is the only thing in marketing. Or you don't even have to talk about marketing, you just have to talk about branding. But frankly, marketing is a much bigger idea than branding. Branding is done for the current picture. You want to have a strong brand, but you need marketing to make sure your company has a strategy of moving along in the right way. In 2010 and, and thereafter, we got interested in the purpose of a company is to create value for its customers. And value is key. Are you creating real value, better value than your competitors? And not only that, do you have any values? If customers were asked about you and whether you're doing any good for society, can you say, yes, we are? What are your values? What do you care about? Now, I'll tell you, I was in Umbria just at the beginning of my trip to Italy. Uh, by the way, I found Umbria to be wonderful. It's sort of not as popular as, uh, you know, other places, uh, Florence and Venice and so on, but so many uh, nice places in Umbria. And I got a letter, and I'm in Umbria for three days to do some work with some people, and it comes from Oslo, a letter from Oslo. Dr. Kotler, could you come to us May 6th? We have a huge conference on business and society. After all, we are the place that the Peace Prize is given. Mr. Obama, who got the Peace Prize, got it in the city hall of Oslo. All the other Nobel Prizes are given in Stockholm, except one. Norway is the place for the Peace Prize. And they were running this conference about business and sustainability, business and society, business and peace. And they were going to have 160 top CEOs there, including the Unilever CEO, who's a wonderful one, Mr. Paul Pullman. Dr. Codley, could you give and give the main speech about how companies are moving toward more business responsibility? So I agreed. I said, but I'm in Perugia. How do I get to Oslo? And I have to be back in Perugia for the next day's program. So they said they'll send a private plane. So they sent a citation that had two pilots, one bathroom, and four seats. So I tell the man who I'm supposed to work for all that day of May 6th, can I go to Oslo and change your program? He says, I will change my program if you take me too. His name is Albert uh, Massoni. I don't know if, Albert, you're here. But in any case, uh, he said, I'll come. And then he says, we have a famous marketing woman professor. Could she come too? So we had a wonderful plane ride of three hours from Perugia direct to Oslo, met all these CEOs, gave my speech, got on the plane again, go, go back to Perugia. But the main point is values, values. Companies should have values. Companies should have a purpose. As a matter of fact, any company that started, I say, what's your purpose? If they say, I want to make money, I said, forget about it. Go to someone else. I want you to make money, but if that's all you're busy doing, 
It doesn't impress me. What are you creating that's worthwhile for people? Okay, I think we're moving into more use of co-creation, working with others to co-create solutions. Do you know, and crowdsourcing, it was Fiat that decided to make a new car through crowdsourcing by asking the world what they want in a nice small new car. Fiat crowdsourced the ideas and ended up creating its next small car. So there's a lot more we could do co-creating, working with others and crowdsourcing. And I think corporate social responsibility is going to grow. If I end up with an index on good companies, no company can remain bad without changing. So the view customers had of marketing, uh, it's all about transactions. It's buying and selling. Then it moved to the idea that marketing is about building relations with individual customers to sort of get them to be loyal. And the idea has become, please engage your customers, involve them, and build a customer community. Build a customer community. You know, Tesco, Tesco is the name of the top British supermarket company. Do you know what Tesco does at night sometimes? They open up the store to the Tesco customers who like wine, and they have a big wine program, no charge. They have the names, they know who buys and likes wine because you could see it in their basket. In other words, Tesco knows everything that any customer ever bought. They could, another night, have a program for mothers who are just uh, had their infants. And they bring a whole bunch of mothers together, and of course they want to help the mothers buy the right things for the babies and so on. So look at, when you have a rich database like Tesco, knowing what everyone bought at your store, you can run many programs that are special to get more engagement, more uh, involvement of your customers. That's how you build loyalty. Um, lots of new things in marketing. Uh, ethnographic marketing. Ethnographic. Do you know there's a man named uh, Underwood? He sits in the shopping centers and he watches where people go. And he, want, he even watches how they enter a store and how much time they spend in front of every shoe or every item of clothing. He's, uh, ethnography is like, uh, our, uh, you know, it's, it's basically uh, like you're studying a tribe. We are, when we go to, we're, we're pe tribal people going to a tribal institution called the supermarket or the shopping center. So Underwood has lots of information. Second thing is neural scanning. We are now testing ideas for a campaign. Let's say I, I have my campaign, but I don't know if I should use actor A or actor B talking about the product. So you put on a person's head a scanner, and it's going to scan their brain waves. And you notice that for person A, when they saw person A, there was a big blip which means something about that, using that person to sell the product, creates more interest, even though it may not have registered if you just asked them, which person do you like better? So right now, the company called Procter & Gamble is using neuromarket, they call it neuromarketing, but you could call it neuroscience, the brain, the science of the brain, is helping us get a better understanding of how people are affected by something that stimulates them. Um, so there's a lot of new analytics. Predictive analytics helps us predict what someone will buy. I, I don't want to go into the details, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's getting some popularity. Cluster analysis allows us to group 
people in interesting clusters so we can treat them as a segment. Marketing mixed modeling aims to get an equation where I could put in the quality of my product, I could put in a number for the price of my product, a number for how much I'm spending on advertising, and I will get a market share number, a prediction of my market share. It's a modeling using equations of, for predicting market share, and then I will maybe adjust the price and see if I get a bigger share that way. Okay, let's move on. Oh, I've already mentioned some examples of big data. I mentioned Tesco to you. Kraft, it's, it's amazing how many numbers these multinational companies have. I'm, I don't know, since Italian companies are more on the small and medium-sized level, you may say this part of marketing is something you're not going to want to spend a lot of money on because uh, it's expensive. Although, if you're a manufacturer of some luxury items, let's say uh, I, I, I'm wearing a, a suit from Zegna. This is a Zegna suit. I'm very happy with them. They should know that I bought it X years ago and to write me just about now because it's time to buy the next suit. So that's what I mean about keeping a database of your customers. If you sold me a, uh, something like a computer three years ago, Maybe so much has happened in three years that I'm ready to buy a better computer, but you should know that you sold me one three years ago. And there's a whole process of big data analysis, so we, we won't uh, do more with that. By the way, today you could buy the names of people for, at a price. Let's say you, you want to find out people who are nearsighted. Not far-sighted, but near-sighted. It will cost you 10 cents a name. You want to uh, find out people who are customer uh, uh, who have been smoking cigarettes for 10 or more years. Cost you 12 cents. You want to find out the names of people who, like me, do not have hair, because you want to try to tell them you can cure that. You can grow hair. You know that's. But so I, there's a whole industry. Uh, we call it, it's a broker, data broker industry. Uh, so I would receive a letter from a data broker. Hi, I hope you are doing fine. I'm checking in to see if you are looking for marketing and data partners and suppliers. We are providing B2B and B2C lists with email addresses. You know, today, data is available for purchase. You don't have to be, actually, if you, cre if you collected great data, you could sell it to someone else. Suppose you have great data on rich customers who like to buy jewelry. Why not sell it to some others who need the names of customers who buy a lot of jewelry? Now, within the uh, marketing organization, and uh, when you're a really large company, uh, you could be like, uh, uh, like Fiat or uh, Pirelli or so on, you, you could have a lot of job positions. You could, all the way from a, a CMO, brand managers, category managers, market segment managers, distribution channel managers, pricing managers. So look, the world of marketing could be quite complex for bigger companies. I'm not recommending it necessarily, but you have to choose the jobs that need specialization. Uh, what determines what what determines the quality of a company's marketing? My first answer is, it is not the CMO, it is the CEO. The head of the company will make the difference as to whether marketing is important to him, well done, and so on. For example, I distinguish four types of CEOs. There's the CEO who I call the one-piece CEO. The only reason he wants marketing is to get some advertising. One P. He doesn't even think product, price, place, promotion. He only thinks promotion. Get me someone who can do some advertising. I think that's a very... I, I wouldn't want to work for that person. That person has such a narrow view of what marketing can do for his firm. The second is the four P. 
Yes, I want someone who could manage my products, my, play, my promotions, my channels, my prices. Better than that, I'd rather work for the third person, who's the CEO, says, who are our customers? Which segments of customers do we want to, do we want older people, younger people? Do we want rich people, poorer people? What segments, what targeting, what positioning? We call that STP, segmenting, targeting, and positioning. And then you bring in the four Ps. You bring in the four Ps after you've decided your segments, your targets, and your positioning. And then there's one kind of CEO, he's the head of Procter & Gamble, he says, M-E, marketing is everything. It's not, it's not even like the others, he says, every company ought to be run by marketing. Not necessarily by a marketing person, but marketing, it's all about customers. It's about, we, we're, we're in a world which creates so much product, we have to have someone good at selling product. So that's what determines the quality of your marketing. Uh, see, what happens is when a father runs a company and he grew up with the old mass marketing, and it's an Italian company, and his son had, went and got an MBA. And technically, the, the son should take over. First of all, the, the son has become digital, or daughter, son or daughter, becomes digital. And there's the conflict between the father's ideas of how he was successful and the son who, or daughter who knows what it's going to take. Okay, I could easily tell you what the CMO does, why you should have a CMO. I'm just going to read this very briefly. You could take a picture of it if you want. If I'm not, you know, I'm blocking the picture of it, unfortunately, for some of you. Uh, Someone to represent what the customers want and think of your company. Someone who will tell us where the customers are moving, what, how are they changing. Someone who would protect the brand and make the brand stronger. Someone who would upgrade the marketing technology. By that I mean cluster analysis, predictive analysis, um, factor analysis. Um, Someone who would bring insight into your portfolio of products. Do you have too many products? Are some of them to be dropped? Are there some products you should have that you don't have yet? And finally, someone, and this is our dream, who can measure the return on marketing investment. R-O-M-I, return on marketing investment. See, because the chief financial officer of the company keeps saying, we're wasting our money on marketing. We don't know what it's doing for us. Your answer is, we'll measure it. We will show you why putting some effort on Facebook has actually increased our sales and our profits. That YouTube ad, that YouTube uh, thing we put together was very profitable. So we do want, by the way, this is the latest thing I ever heard, that a company in the United States fired its chief marketing officer and replaced him by who? The chief financial officer. Wow. You mean a financial guy could do better marketing than the marketing guy? Well, at least the financial guy's gonna measure, right? He has to measure. That's why I urge all marketers to learn finance. Please, you're in the business to make money, among other things, so you better be good at thinking about asset turnover and uh, the cost of money and, and what is your return on your uh, money. So the CMO has a busy job. However, he should only spend 50% of the time doing marketing. He should spend the other 50% working with the chief finance officer, working with the chief manufacturing people, working with the, uh, the personnel people, because he or she should form a good role in the organization and, 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 and so on. I sometimes use this illustration. I say, I'm appointing you the, as a new marketing chief. You're the new marketing chief. 
where would you like the, your office to be? I could put your office right next to the president of the company. Would you like your office to be next to him? Which means every day you're going to see him. He's, he's going to be uh, watching you. Or would you want to be next to the chief financial officer? Or would you like to be next to the chief technology officer? Or next to the chief information officer? Or next to the vice president of sales? If we had time, I would ask you to vote. I could argue for each one of these. Whenever I take a vote, most people say, I want to be next to the sales force, the last one. Because if they do well, and I can help them do well, I'll look better. And I don't want to be next to the president. He's going to ask too many questions. So, but you may be different. You may say, I want to be right next to the president so I could educate the president on what I could do. Okay. I'm going to skip some things. Can marketing help grow the company's future? Some people say, no, marketing is only a cost center. It doesn't have a bottom line. And I disagree. I would say marketing is in the best position to detect business opportunities, calibrate their size, and estimate their likely profitability. That marketing managers are so important because they manage intangible assets. They manage your brands. They manage your customer relationships. They manage your networks, your market position, your market information. So I would say yes. The future of your company is going to be a function of how good a marketing organization you have. Let me give you examples. These are people who are great at marketing. And they, they, are not, they are not professional marketers. They're CMO, CEOs. You know them all. Who is the first fellow? The first fellow you wouldn't have recognized, but that's Ingvar Kamprad, who started the I IKEA. What a great, brilliant idea, IKEA, of, of a way to sell furniture. It's, it's a shopping trip that takes a whole day. You bring your children. You put your children in the uh, child center so you don't have to worry about them. Uh, you get a restaurant, you eat your Swedish meatballs in Ikea because you're there half the day looking at furniture. Uh, but I think, what a visionary. He has members. You could be a member for, of Ikea. You'll have lower prices as a result of being a member. Everyone knows about Richard Branson. I mean, that, that, he has marketing in his blood. He runs 150 other companies. Virgin, uh, Virgin Trains, Virgin Air, Virgin Music, Virgin this and that. There's only one other person who took a word and made it into a number of businesses. Um, the one who has easy, what's it called? He's a Greek fellow and he's using the word easy. Easy flying, easy uh, beds, easy this. He, he, he owns the word easy, and, and you can expect things to be easy when you buy any of his products. Walt Disney, superb marketer. Herb Kelleher, Southwest Airlines. Anita Roddick, The Body Shop. Bill Gates, Microsoft. Steve Jobs, uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, so basically, uh, that's the kind of person who is a dreamer. I think uh, in this day, you're going to have another person who is going to tell you how to get dreams and, and sell your dreams. Uh, uh, this is an interesting book. Um, about four years ago, Scott Davis, who is a good consultant, very good consultant, he visited 40 big companies, very big companies, and he asked, what's new in marketing? So if you're interested, you'll find lots of stories of trends taking place in marketing. Um, one trend is we're moving from just creating a marketing strategy to driving the business impact, where marketing is not just has its own strategy, but it's actually driving the business uh, and so on. Second, from just controlling the message to galvanizing the network so more people are talking about us and not just, you know, it's a new world with digital. From just 
incremental improvements to pervasive innovation, where everyone wants to innovate. By the way, that's the secret of Toyota. Everyone at Toyota will be thinking all the time, is it necessary for me to do this or that, to make this component or not? Because at Toyota, they don't lose their job when they, they show they don't, they're not needed in that job. They don't, they, they're put in another job. They all want to keep... By the way, the other company that is pervasive innovation is Samsung. The Korean company Samsung has hurt Sony terribly. The Koreans were occupied by the Japanese, right? And guess what? They became more Japanese than the Japanese. They are more Japanese than the Japanese. And think of their company LG. Think of their company Hyundai, the auto company. Think of Kia. So Samsung has got the, the, in the, per, the bug of per, pervasive innovation. Um, fourth shift, from managing marketing investments to inspiring marketing excellence. And the fifth, from operational focus to a deep customer focus. So basically, what I'm saying is, the book is full of stories he found by talking to about 40 companies about what was new. Um, the average company doesn't last long, by the way. Sad fact. Maybe, especially some new restaurants, they become maybe popular and then we're worn out, we go to some other pop, new popular one. Um, all kinds of reasons why companies often fail. Um, by the way, in Italy, it may be partly because the company is run in a way to maximize short-term profit. So, so you pay yourself back in dividends. You take the money out. You don't do R&D. You don't want to grow the company to last forever. Problem, it could be a cultural problem. So, yet there are some companies that have lasted so many years. What is their magic? By the way, the oldest organization in the world is, is the Catholic Church. 2,000 years of being in business. So, there's something there, but my own feeling, I am not Catholic, but my own feeling is they need to adjust, and they have the best pope they've ever had in Francis. He's aware, he's so smart, that it has to adjust to the new trends, and so on. So what are the secrets of these long-lasting companies? By the way, among them are DuPont, W.R. Grace, P&G, Mitsui, Sumitoma, Siemens. They have been around over hundreds of years. Here's what was found in a book you might want to read called Living Companies. It was done by uh, the, the, the man, um, Ari de Goose. He worked for Shell. He was the strategic planner. They found that if you expect your company to live a long time, you've got to be somewhat conservative in your finance. I'm, in other words, control your risk. You've got to be sensitive to the changes going on in the world. You've got to be aware of who you are. You have an identity. If, you, if it's a good identity, don't lose it. Don't, don't compromise. Be authentic. And tolerate new ideas. Don't be afraid of new ideas. They're good for you. And then he found four priorities. These long-lasting companies, they value people, the people who work for them, more than the assets. Yes, it's nice to have a factory, but I value the people more. I look, uh, they, they, they have, they steer and control. In other words, they steer into new ways, but they also exercise control. They are organized to learn. They're learning, lifelong learning organizations. And they want to have a good impact on the community, shaping good communities. That's the nature of those companies that were listed. By the way, um, Got to see what my time is here, uh, 11.36. Well, we'll find out, but I, I want to share a few more things with you. Uh, this is a wonderful way to, to see how a brand is built. Uh, this is the story of Starbucks. 
Starbucks builds its brand at a number of levels. You could use this for your own branding. The first is, what is your brand mantra? S essentially, what, what Starbucks says, we are delivering a rich, rewarding coffee? No, coffee experience. You see the difference? It's what we call experiential marketing. It's not just coffee, that's a problem. It's the experience of coffee. Um, now, once you agree that that's what it is, you're going to be like certain other companies who are competitors and different. See, you're going to be like other companies because you're going to fairly price, you're going to be responsible and involved, but you're going to be different. You're going to have fresher coffee. It's going to be more types of coffee. It's going to be very good service. In other words, there always has to be points of, of parity where you're equal to your competitors and points of differentiation. Now, once you establish points of difference, we call these pods, P-O-D-S, pods. How do you prove that you are different and better? So the next circle says, look, we use triple filtrated water. We give stock options to our employees so that they in themselves could be owners of Starbucks. Uh, we uh, give 24-hour training before they get on the job. We're very integrated. So they have the, what, the evidence, the evidence that they're different and better, not just claiming that they're different and better. And finally, they say they have a set of values and a personality and character. Uh, and they have a visual identity. They have a picture of a siren, earth colors. So when you build your brand, what's your mantra? How are you different than your competitors? I hope you have some differences. Uh, what is the evidence that your differences are not just claimed, but true? And what did you add in the way of personality and character to your business? By the way, I've been talking about consumer examples, but I've been very close to B2B, business to business. Most of the world is B2B. Most of the world is businesses selling other things to businesses. So I wrote a book called B2B Branding because businesses selling to other businesses, they didn't work hard enough on the idea of being a brand. Well, Ericsson is a brand, of course. Siemens is a brand. Yes, some of them do it. As a matter of fact, listed here are the companies I selected as the best ones doing good branding, even though they're a B2B company. One of the best, by the way, is DuPont and Michelin. By the way, I sh would we put P Pirelli down here? Maybe. I'm sure my book had something about Pirelli. I can't remember what I said. But these are the star B2B businesses that do good branding. So you could read, if you're B2B, you could read chapters on how these companies operate. Another book was related to that, B2B, but it has to do with the problem called ingredients. For example, um, what is an, an ingredient? Let me show you what I mean. I don't sell clothing. I, I use Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex is the material. When I make a, a fine, weather all-weather jacket, I use Gore-Tex. Now, if you don't say Gore-Tex, people don't know that it's better than the other materials. Uh, another example would be carpets. Not only do I make carpets, but I use Stain Master. So if someone drops some coffee on the carpet, they can clean it off very easily. Stain Master becomes an ingredient which you don't net see in the carpet, but it's there. Not only do I sell you diet drinks, but I'm using NutraSweet. Now, NutraSweet is one of those things you don't know necessarily about, but it is giving you sweetness without the sugar. Uh, cooking utensils, uh, Teflon, uh, bicycle gears, uh, Shimano, making very good gears for bicycles, Dolby for sound systems. And one of the best examples is Intel inside. See, Intel. The chip inside your computer is not normally known. You would never have known that. 
Did any of you ever buy a computer and open it up to see if there really is an Intel chip inside? You, you, you have trust, don't you, that it's inside? Because they spend a lot of money convincing the computer companies to use their Intel chip because it would be cheaper not to use the Intel chip. But we're all caught up in this. See, you could take a commodity that no one knows about and make it into a, a branded product. So that book is full of stories about taking an ingredient and making it special. And Swarovski, I mean, you could buy crystal and crystal, but Swarovski really makes very fine crystal. Marketing is more than just products and services. That's what we call commercial marketing. Very big development called place marketing. I wrote a book called Marketing Places. I went to a city called Bilbao in Spain. Nobody ever went to be a tourist in Bilbao. Bilbao is a nice city. In the 1920s, it was a rich city. But everyone wants to go to Madrid or Barcelona. So they said, how do we get more tourists? I said, well, you got a place marketing problem. You're not well known, and there's no reason to come here necessarily. And they said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, you build an Eiffel Tower. Oh, no, but Paris built an Eiffel Tower. We can't be a copycat. I said, well, build something that people have to see. You've got to give them a reason to go to Bilbao. I said, even build a museum. Oh, we can't build a museum. We don't have much good art. All the good art is in Madrid. I said, it doesn't matter. Make the museum a work of art. And they did. They hired Frank Gehry. And he designed this fantastic museum that has not good art. It itself is the art. And they used to have chartered flights from Japan to go to see that Frank Geary Museum in Bilbao. So place marketing, uh, now there are some experts who could take a city and make it work better. Get more tourists. Get more companies to invest and move in. Person marketing is... How do you help a person get better known? Uh, let's say a celebrity. Um, so I wrote a book called High Visibility. High Visibility. How do you get attention? Nowadays with the internet, you can really do a job. As a matter of fact, one of the most popular new types of books are called Me the Brand. Hey, each of us is a brand. Each of, if I'm an electrician, I want to be known as the best electrician or the best plumber, or the best accountant, or the best lawyer. What do I do to get high visibility? Because then I could charge more. So branding has come to people, not just to products and services. And social marketing is how to use marketing to help people live healthier. How can I help you understand why you should stop smoking? How can I help you Avoid hard drugs, not to get into that habit. How can I help you uh, watch out for HIV, AIDS, and so on by your behavior? How do I campaign to get you to... And how do I get you to exercise every day? How do I get you to eat better foods? Less salt, less, less uh, fat, less sugar. So social marketing, we just published our fifth edition with new examples of 200 or 300 cases of where marketing ideas were used to help people change to a better behavior through campaigns and so on. And we, we don't, don't confuse that with social media. It's social marketing. There's another term called social media marketing. It's how to use social media in your marketing. But I'm talking about marketing used for social purposes. And then, of course, Italy is, knows very much about political marketing. Every politician, I think it started with Obama. How could this young man who was just a lawyer uh, teaching constitutional law at the University of Chicago become president? Um, besides his personal charisma, he had a whole system. He was one of the first politicians to use the Internet, to use social media. And it's, it worked brilliantly. Now every politician has to have people who are digital, who can use the networks to get uh, messages out. Um, now, uh, we're, uh, let me ask my, my sponsor, uh, is this about five more minutes? 
five yeah because there's more I could be here all day by the way when I used to come to Italy it was a full day <laughs> of my talking at the end I'd have no voice um, on digital what's this about first I list on the left traditional media all of you should be using that on the right I list the new media what I'm saying do not give up the traditional it has a function it's good for brand building, brand awareness, you know, big ads and all that. But start giving some of your advertising money, let's say 10%, to some millennials who you've hired and say, here, go on Facebook, do something, look around, you, you know the media. Tell us what we could try to do with 10% budget. If it performs very well, I'll give you more money. How about, you did very well, here's 20% of our budget. So the question is, you don't say anything like, I should only spend X percent for digital. Instead, you experiment. If it works, you give it more. My prediction is, digital will be 50% of the budget in about three to five years. That the work you're gonna do in communicating, in communicating, will be done by 50% digital work and 50% traditional. By the way, they interact. Every time you see an ad or hear it, it may say, for more information, go to www. So it interacts very much. Oh, by the way, this is just a sad picture about a lot of industries that have been destroyed by digital. But let's move on. Um, uh, that what are the digital tools? Of course, computers, databases, programmable devices, software, internet, smartphones, you, you know the world. Uh, there have been studies um, that companies are pretty slow to adapting to digital. Uh, in, in 2013, 76% said marketing has changed Oh, that was good news. Marketing has changed more in the last two years than in the last 50 because of digital. Only 9% strongly agree, I know that our digital marketing is working. At that time, in 2013, they were doing digital, but they weren't sure it was working. 60% uh, say digital marketing uh, approaches are in a constant cycle of trial and error. So you're going to be wasting some of your money doing digital, but you're going to be learning. I love this picture. I don't know where this guy is from. He's smoking a cigarette. He's probably raising money, and he's got a phone. The point is the new media must be blended with the old media in a mutually reinforcing way. If you ask me whether P&G uses digital, yes. Today, they officially say 25 to 35% of their budget for their soaps, for their diapers, is digital work, and the rest is still traditional work. Uh, companies have to get better at search engine optimization so that your company's name or your brand will be the first to show up that's a whole world in itself of how you get to be seen faster than your competitors. Be aware that big data requires a dramatic change in the skills in your company, the leadership of your company, the organization of your company, the technologies and the architectures. So to, to go digital is not just to have some people doing digital work. It's really calling for a reorganization. Uh, because the power is shifting to the customers. Customers are buying things by looking them up on the Internet. They, you don't buy a car without going on the Internet to find out a lot about the car and what other people say. In Asia in particular, the consumers are on their, their iPhones and their other things all the time. In fact, uh, if my wife is an example, she does not go into stores anymore. She never goes into stores. Every day, packages arrive. Everything is ordered online. About 20% of the packages are returned. We pay a little for the mail. She is that new shopper who 
doesn't see any advantage to going into a store. Now, other people want to go in and touch the fabric and, and so on. Even then, the big problem of stores is people go in to see the merchandise, then they go online to buy. So the store is changing into an advertising media. If you're selling electronics, no one's buying in the store. It shows the electronics, but you go home and order it. So it's a problem for stores. Marketers are underprepared for the new age. That is, the people who ran marketing have to go into a learning training. Do you know that CEOs in some companies are giving an hour a week with a young man or woman in the company being told what digital is? The CEO wants to know more about it, and he sits at the feet of a digital person to learn what's involved. So this is an IBM study from 2011 saying that at that time we were pretty unprepared. And that CMOs have to become more financially minded. I, I made that point to you. So to increase your digital activities, there's a lot of things to do. Have a good website. By the way, you'll know if you have a good website in two ways. One is to ask your customers who've used it. How could we improve our website? See how many pages they go through on your website. If they just see the first page and never do anything more, it's not getting to them. Secondly, ask experts to improve your website. Buy customer information uh, that tracks the interest patterns of specific consumers. You know, you could find out from Facebook a lot about what people are buying and moving and get interested in. Um, I, one of the things you want to know is, are you talked about on the internet? Does anyone talk about your company? I guess if no one talks about your company, that's okay. It's better than if they were saying bad things. Normally, if you're talked about a lot, if, if you find some things that are coming up that are bad, you better correct that very quickly. Um, Lots of other things here. So basically, we got a process here. We got a plan, we got to manage, we got to execute, we got to measure. And the interesting thing is in the next slide. In the old days, the only time you would buy help from an outside firm was to buy your marketing research from an outside research firm or you would buy your advertising from an advertising agency. Today I can distinguish nine other things you might buy. You may want to buy database management and warehousing capability. In other words, NCR, Oracle, IBM, all of them will compete for your wish to get a good database going. Or you may want better business intelligence and analytics. Here's a bunch of firms that say, hey, I could help you know more about your competitors in, in an honest way, but I, I have skills. Three, marketing mix. I could build a model of your market and how if you change the prices, it will predict your market share. Or campaign management. Or other things. All the way to that last one. Maybe you should do what the airlines do. The airlines look at how much, how many seats were sold on the plane that's going to leave three days from now? If there aren't that many seats that they sold, they will tell the travel agents that there's a lower price for selling seats on that plane. Automatically. And if they, on the other hand, if they have sold almost all the seats, the, the rule says raise the price on the next remaining seats because someone will need a seat and you can charge more. So pricing, it's called yield-based pricing, has been turned over to automation. Automation. So what, what I'm saying is today, the big complaint I get from um, CMOs is every day I get 10 companies calling me trying to sell me something. There are so many specialists to help with your marketing. I, I, wanna, I should listen to the right ones, but I don't want to spend my time... My, by the way, what's worse is that sales people are finding it harder to get to see the customer. 
Many customers say, I can know so much about your business without seeing you. I just go on the internet and I learn about you in so many ways, I don't need to see, even give you 15 minutes. So we're wondering what's the future of the sales force if people are so well informed without a salesman visiting them. And so the corporate social, this is another piece of glass I collect, by the way, but uh, I like this piece because it shows that the earth is delicately balanced, very near to falling off if it isn't careful. We got to, the, the new three Ps are people, planet, and profits. A company should be paying attention to people, rewarding them well, the planet, sustainability, and, and profits. And that makes up another P called performance. You're performing if you pay attention. So this is about capitalism, but look at Paul Pullman's statement. He heads Unilever. He says, we ask him, what's your ambition? He says, our ambition, ambitions are to double our business. When? You mean in the next year? No, no. In the next five years, double our business. But to do that while reducing our environmental impact and footprint, it has to be done via more responsible consumption. We all admire this man. Yes, he wants to grow his business, but he wants to do it in the right way. Do you know what he wants to do? He wants to measure Unilever's footprint, car carbon footprint and reduce that carbon footprint. Because eventually we may put a tax on companies higher where there's more carbon damage, more carbon being released in the air, more methane, more bad things. So that's the kind of management we want. Marketing 3.0, which I co-authored with my, my friend, I just want to say this, you can read the book, but basically it talks about a movement from just appealing to the mind of the customer to appeal, appealing to the heart of the customer to appear, appealing to the spirit of the customer as we develop our mission, our vision, and our values. And it's full of illustrations of companies like the S.C. Johnson Company, how everything they do is very caring about the planet. And um, uh, so one more book that would be of interest if, if, if it comes up. I think I, uh, yeah. Um, by the way, remember this slide. You all know this. This is called the Maslow um, Hierarchy of Needs. In Africa, many countries, they're just at the physiological level. They just need food, uh, health care. We, so we... As we move to, to safety we, and we get a shelter, we change our needs. As we move to belonging and want more uh, part of a group, and then there's esteem, and then self-actualization. You have to be pretty well off to even start thinking about self-actualization. But I want to add to self-actualization that you should also think of other actualization. How do you help others actualize? Yeah, it's nice to fulfill your dreams, but how do you help others also have that chance? So this is one of my favorite books. I wish I had written it, but uh, I know the people. Try to do this in Italy. They did this in the United States. They stopped people on the street and said, is there any company that you love? So some people said, well, I don't love a company. Well, is there any that you would miss? Once they said that, I would miss Google. I, I would go crazy if there was no Google. I would miss Coca-Cola. I would miss... So 25 companies ended up being mentioned repeatedly. Uh, these are companies people love in the United States. Let's do it for Italy. Let's find out which Italian companies do people in Italy love. But here's what they did with this. They found out that all of these firms were highly profitable. They outperformed their competitors. 
they had happier employees and customers, more innovation, more profitable suppliers, and they were more environmentally involved. What more can you ask for from a company that succeeds this way? So what they did, and this is the, my last statement to you, they wanted to see what is common to all 25 companies. These are companies that don't focus on the shareholders, but on the stakeholders. Not just to make money for some owner, but to make well-being for the people who are partners, stakeholders. Two, their executive salaries, even the CEOs in these companies don't get paid those outrageous amounts where the fellow who runs the Oracle company takes home $90 million a year. $90 million, that's about a thousand times more than the average worker. You know, the average CEO used to get maybe 20 to 40 times what the average worker gets. And in the United States now, it's something like uh, three to 500 times. So these are companies that don't go crazy. The next thing is they operate an open door policy. You can talk to the boss when you want to. You can send him an email. You can tell the boss that you're worried about uh, some part of the product line or something. You don't have to go to your supervisor. The worst thing is when you say, I have an idea for the company, and I'm going to give it to the president. And he says, no, don't do that. Maybe it's going to be a bad idea. Don't take your time. Don't waste your time. So the good idea is don't go to the top. In these companies, you can reach the CEO with an idea. The employee compensation and benefits are high in these companies, just like Starbucks. Very. Employee training is longer, and their employee turnover is lower. Um, they hire people who care about customers and people. You want to work with people who care about people. There are some people who don't care about anyone else. So these companies are careful there. They hire, they, they think suppliers are important. Really get good suppliers, and, and suppliers who want to improve their own business and in the process will reduce your costs. They believe that their corporate culture is their greatest asset. It's a company that says, we have a very good culture. People are happy at our company. This is the last one, and this is going to be really uh, stimulating to you. Their marketing budget is lower in these companies than their competitors. The competitors, not being as good as these companies, spend more on marketing to try to make a name when, in fact, they don't have to spend much because who is doing the advertising? Their customers. You understand, they've turned their customers into their advertisers. Sure, I work for Pirelli or something. I'm happy with that company and, you know. So, basically, read that book. Firms of endearment, companies people find dear, and they have a lot in common. Love to see it done for Italy. It'll be interesting to find what companies we love in Italy. That's it. Thank you very much for being with me.